I'm now going to go deeper into Microsoft Azure and how you can take advantage of it to build amazing solutions. Now, one of the defining aspects of cloud computing is the ability to innovate and release new technology faster and at greater scale than ever before. You know, this set of technology, things like IoT, AI, microservices, serverless computing, and more, is all happening right now, thanks in large part to cloud computing. And it's an incredibly exciting time to be in IT, and the opportunities to explore new approaches and new technologies have never been greater. But at the same time, I also recognize that while all this stuff is really cool, uh, it can also be a little overwhelming. You know, I hear that in a lot of my conversations with customers around the world. You know, the expectation to know all of these new technologies and be up to date with them all the time can sometimes leave you feeling like you're falling behind. And the expectations your companies have on you to quickly deliver breakthrough experiences with all of this new technology is super high. And in a lot of cases, your companies are betting on you really to deliver the new digital experiences that are going to transform and power those businesses going forward. And at the same time, there's this constant worry we all have about someone hacking the apps and the systems that we're building. And you know you have to be super careful about security while simultaneously trying to be an expert on all this new tech and deliver breakthrough solutions on schedule. And needless to say, all of this is not easy. And it's really with this understanding that shapes how we build and deliver Azure. You know, my team comes to work each day working to make Azure a powerful enterprise-grade cloud service. But the more important work we do is building Azure to help guide your success. Having great technology and lots of features is necessary but not sufficient. Uh, it's really about how successful you can be using this technology and the cloud. And to deliver on this, we focus Azure innovation really on your needs. You know, by making cutting-edge technology approachable to all IT professionals, and doing the heavy lifting to ensure that Azure uniquely meets enterprise scenarios. This means having an end-to-end -end experience across all of our cloud services, our management tools, our development tools, uh, to provide an incredibly productive cloud experience, one that's hybrid and that enables you to build solutions that run consistently both inside our public cloud data centers as well as within your own data centers. It means having a cloud that enables you to use AI and data to infuse richer intelligence into your solutions, and it means having a cloud that you can trust. You know, trust is a core value of Azure, and we lead the industry with our work on security, compliance, privacy, and responsibility. And this focus that we have on delivering innovation, trust, and results is really leading to tremendous adoption of Azure right now. You know, startups, governments, and over 90% of Fortune 500 companies in the world are now running their businesses using the Microsoft Cloud in Azure. And these are just a handful of some of the customers running on Azure today. What I thought I'd do is just show a quick video of some of them talking about how they're using Azure to drive their success. Let's watch a video. You need comprehensive tooling to build, deploy, and manage them efficiently. And one of the things that really makes Azure unique is the end-to-end -end management experience that we deliver. Whether it's with our management portal, uh, our new PowerShell and Bash command line experiences, and with a built-in support for making things like monitoring, log analytics, patching, backup and site recovery super easy. And to give you an idea of kind of what this overall looks like, as well as to show off some of the great new capabilities that we're releasing today, I'd like to invite Corey Sanders on stage to demo Azure in action. Excellent. Good morning, everybody. I am going to show you how easy it is as an IT professional to be able to use Azure. I'm gonna make you more efficient, more productive, and hopefully have a little more fun in the meantime. So I'm really excited. Are you guys excited? All right. So I'm going to start with infrastructure. Now, we have lots of infrastructure in Azure. We have lots of different options. We have GPU-powered infrastructure. We have InfiniBand-powered HPC machines. We have large CPUs. We have lots of memory. But what I'm going to show you today is our really, really, really large machine, our M series. And so here I've got 128 vCPUs. I'm going to zoom in here and show you. Here I'm running at 3.8 terabytes of memory. So this is a, a, a honking machine. And this is going to be good for running very large SQL servers or SAP HANA to be able to run on this. But you can also do some other interesting things on this. Like you can run nested virtualization right on top of this. So here you can see I'm running two virtual machines inside this virtual machine. 
So I'm running a Linux machine and a Windows machine inside. And so you may want to do this for Hyper-V replica or taking Hyper-V snapshots. You can also do Hyper-V based containers to get higher security based containers all running inside this machine. And what's great about this is I'm running both Windows and Linux in here. If I actually click open my Windows machine, you'll see another running Hyper-V. So now I've got another Hyper-V inside a virtual machine. So this is a VM inside a VM inside an Azure VM. So it's truly an inception moment here for all of us. And of course, running this is quite a dream. OK, let's go back. So I've showed you how to create VMs a lot in the past. But what I'm going to show you today, instead of creating a VM through the portal, I'm going to show you a different way. I'm going to show it using PowerShell right here in the portal experience. So you can see here, available today in preview, PowerShell built into the Azure portal. So this is this goes anywhere. This is tied to the browser. Yes. Yes. Tied to your browser can run on any OS. It can run in any browser. And it can also run on your iPhone. So you can start doing PowerShell right on your iPhone. And let me show you, if you want to create a virtual machine here, oops. If you want to create a virtual machine here, you, if you're familiar with our, if, with our PowerShell, it used to take many, many commands. Many, many commands to get this going. Now, it takes just one parameter. And with that, I'll pass in my username and password, and it creates a VM. So you don't have to worry about all the other configuration unless you want to. Just that fast. Now, if I want to go in and actually run a query, if I want to actually go do some searches, I can also do that right here in this experience. And so if I'm actually going to go in and run, let's say I want to get all my virtual machines running here. And then let's say I want to actually stop them. You know, I'm done with my demo, so let's go ahead and stop them. But wait, I'm a little bit nervous. I don't know all the VMs that are in my account. So I can use classic PowerShell what if to validate what this command's actually going to do. And you can see it's going to run through and tell me what will happen if this command runs. So available right here as part of the PowerShell commands. And you can see as I go through this, there, there is a VM down here that, that's actually called do not stop me. So maybe I want to go dig into that one and see before I actually go run this. Wouldn't it be great if life had a what if command? Yeah, well, I guess I'll have to deal with PowerShell for now. OK, so I showed you how to manage this right here in PowerShell. Let me show you some of the really cool PowerShell, excuse me, uh, management experiences that Scott just talked about. So right here in the portal experience, I've got a virtual machine running. And down here in operations, you'll see a few new, th a few new things. Disaster recovery, update management, inventory, and change tracking built right here into the portal experience. And so if I go ahead and click on update management, what this is going to show me are all of the updates that have been installed or need to be installed on this virtual machine. So this is showing me OS updates right here in the portal experience. So you can see I'm missing this Windows Defender, so I may want to go install that. It shows me the updates that have, have succeeded, and I can go into the details on exactly what those updates contained. I can even go in and schedule the updates right here in the portal experience. And so I can say critical updates, security updates, pick which ones. I can exclude specific KBs right here in this portal experience. But what's great about this is it doesn't just work on one machine. It works across all the machines of my infrastructure. So if I click across manage machines across my entire infrastructure, it'll show me all of the updates across everything. It'll show me the updates across all of my Linux machines. It'll show me updates across all my Windows machines. So you can see here, I've got a few Linux machines that need updates. So these are OS updates for Linux and Windows right here in the Azure portal. But wait, it's not just Azure. You can manage and track your updates that are required for on-premises machines too. So right here in the Azure portal, you're doing updates across on-prem, in Azure, Windows, or Linux, all in the same experience. That's right. That's exciting. But wait, there's more. I can also do change tracking. So here you can see I'm running a virtual machine. This is tracking every change that's happening on my virtual machine. Every file that's changed, every event that happens, every registry change that happens. I can zoom down and actually take a look at all the changes and search for things that I'm looking for. Again, not just a single machine though. If I want to look across my entire environment, I can see all the changes across all my environments, Windows or Linux, 
and decide and figure out what's going on. These are the last 24 hours. I can also zoom in. Hey, you know, registry updates, those make me a little bit nervous. Let me zoom into that. And let's search here and see what that, what that update was. And so right here, if I, if I type correctly, right here, you can see and zoom in and see what does that change and what is it doing and go investigate if you need to. It's excellent. Okay, so that's change tracking. Now, one of the really important parts of managing your infrastructure is being able to handle disaster recovery. So let me click on this. Now more than ever, given the amount of global disasters that we're seeing just impacting so many people, making sure you have a plan for what you're going to do with your infrastructure, with your applications in the event of such, a, such an occurrence is really important. And traditionally, it's really, really hard. It's really hard to set that up. You've got to make sure you have the space, to make sure you have the hardware. You've got to make sure you test it because disaster recovery plan is not any good if you haven't tested it. And so here now with Azure, we make it incredibly easy. So I clicked on, on disaster recovery. I can configure site recovery right here, pick my target region, and it will show me a picture of exactly what that lo will look like when I do this failover. So I can pick from any of the Azure regions to do this. Now, that's not all. Once I've configured that, if I want to run a test failover, it is literally a single click. So I'm here in disaster recovery. I've got a second virtual machine. I can decide the virtual network that I want to deploy it into and hit OK. And that's going to set this virtual machine up in a test configuration in that other location for me to make sure my app and my environment works while keeping the original production one up and running. Single click, disaster recovery, automatic. I hear clapping over here. Let's do it. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Thank you. That's awesome. Very, very cool. Now, the key point here, this isn't just a single machine. You can do this across a set of machines, build a recovery plan across many machines, do them in order, and actually run scripts according to that. So I've shown you disaster recovery, I've shown you change management, and I've shown you update management. The last thing I'm going to show you is monitoring. And so with monitoring, we have log analytics built right here in the portal experience. And if I click on overview, it's going to give me a set of pre-built operations that I can run, pre-built set of uh, stats that I can look at, things like the, uh, the amount of uh, threats that I have from anti-malware and so on, all built in. But if I want to do something a little bit more detailed, I can click on analytics here and go straight into the analytics designer. And this allows me to actually take a look at my queries, and you can see these queries are quite, quite simple, actually, to write. They're very SQL-like, and they allow me to do very custom things. So in this case, you see here, I'm running over the last seven days. I'm going to look at the pr processor time of all my virtual machines in this specific subscription, and it's going to do uh, group them by computer, and then it's going to show you the time chart. And so let's zoom back out here, and you can see it shows me a very pretty time chart that's going to show me spikes of all of those CPU processor times across those seven days. Now let me do something a little bit deeper. And let me zoom in here and show you this one. This is going to look at my SharePoint farm. I'm going to run this. And what this is doing is it's actually going to look at the average CPU compared to the IIS requests on that SharePoint farm and map it out in a visual way so I can see if they're related, if there's correlation there. And it then just renders that time chart. Very simple query to do incredibly custom things across millions of records. And in seconds, I have this beautiful chart that'll show me, well, well, it looks like maybe this period there was some correlation. Maybe I should dig in and understand what's going on. And even further, let's say I want to understand which browser I'm running, uh, which browser is hitting my site. I can very easily do that. Again, millions of records, every user agent string in my entire, uh, in my entire in, uh, deployment, and I can see who's calling what from where, and you can see there's actually been a spike of Firefox usage right there. So I showed you a gigantic virtual machine. I showed you nested virtualization. No other cloud can do nested virtualization. I showed you PowerShell built right into the portal, and you can also run that on your iPhone. No other cloud is doing that. I showed you update management and change management. No other cloud is supporting that. And I showed you disaster recovery with a single click between sites. No other cloud is doing that. And finally, I showed you very simple query language to go across millions of records in a second to create a beautiful picture for your analysis. And you guessed it, no other cloud is doing that. I hope you have a wonderful Ignite. Back to you, Scott. So Corey showed you kind of just sort of the built-in management capabilities that all of you have 
and can basically take advantage of out of the box when you use Azure. And you know, all this really helps you build and really uh, deliver hugely successful solutions on top of the cloud. You know, HSBC is a great example of a company that's realizing tremendous success with Azure right now. HSBC is one of the 10 largest banks in the entire world, and they've now deployed a number of solutions on top of Azure. Here's a video of them talking about the success they've had in the IT agility that Azure is providing them. Cloud connected experiences with ASP.NET Core. And where you get started is where I always get started, right inside of Visual Studio. I'm right inside of Visual Studio, and all I have to do is say File, New Project. Inside of the New Project dialogs, we have lovely templates for Android, iOS, Apple TV, and cross-platform templates to build your mobile apps and your ASP.NET Core backends. Now, I've started to build an application here, and I want to focus on mobile first. And I'm building an expense application so I can send Scott all my expenses after Ignite. So over here, we have a Xamarin solution with my actual ASP.NET Core Web API backend. And here I have things like models and cloud service backends, view models, and actual XAML views, because I'm sharing 100% of my source code and user interface between iOS, Android, and Windows. And I still have those projects here. So if I want to actually write the platform-specific code, I have access to 100% of the APIs all in C Sharp, which is delightful. Now, to get started, though, we know that there's complications with emulators, simulators, Mac build machines, all of this stuff. And we wanted to make it simple so anyone could get started with just an iOS or Android device and their PC with Visual Studio. So let's get my iPhone up here. I have a real iPhone. And I, what I'm going to do here is launch my actual brand new Xamarin Live Player application. What I'm going to do is over the local Wi-Fi is pair Visual Studio to the Xamarin Live Player device. So let's go ahead and pair it here. And I'm going to scan it. There we go, and boom. Right over the Wi-Fi, I'm connected to Visual Studio and ready to deploy my application. So here, I have my Azure's iPhone player, which is this iPhone right here. I'm gonna hit debug, just like I always have. But over the local Wi-Fi connection, it's gonna send all the files to my iOS device and it shows up in mere moments, being interpreted on the device. That's crazy, and it's, a, it's, it's ridiculous. It blows my mind every time I do that, but it's a real app, so I can browse through. I can actually hit add here, and I'm actually inside of a real live debug session with a breakpoint. So I can browse through all the code here. I can continue on and use the application that I would expect. So let's go browse a little bit, and I need to spice up my wardrobe with some you know, red polos to match Scott, so those are what, like $9.99. And uh, we'll add some geolocation maybe. And heck, let's just add a receipt so I can send this off to Scott. So I'm using my application and I'm using cross-platform code inside of this project to access native features like geolocation and to get photos. And we can continue on. But what I love here is that we've made it really possible to not only debug over local Wi-Fi to a physical device, but to also rapidly iterate on the user interface. So here I'm gonna go back to this list page of all of my, my data. I'm gonna say Xamarin Live Player, live run this current view. And immediately my application shows up and I can just start working on it. So here what I'm gonna do is just go over here and I have a header I wanna add. So I'm gonna go and drag and drop it in. Visual Studio waits for me to basically just stop editing and boom, it updates in real time. I can come back over and if I wanna make more code modifications, let's say red, I can go ahead and do that, shows up. And as it waits for me to finish, redeploys and updates again, right over the local Wi-Fi without having me even save. Now. Now let's switch over to my ASP.NET Core backend and get rid of that iPhone. So inside of this project, I also mentioned that this application is reaching out to my ASP.NET Core web API. So inside of this project, I have a .NET standard library where I'm sharing code between them as well. Now, I've been debugging it locally on my machine here at Ignite, but I want to make sure that when I deploy it, it can work absolutely anywhere. And what I'm going to do is leverage Docker. Now, what I don't know much about images and containers. Donovan tries to explain it to me every single day. I still don't get it. But all I know is I need to add Docker, so what do I do? Let Visual Studio handle it by right-clicking and saying Add Docker Support. One click. It'll automatically scaffold out all the infrastructure I need to put this into a Docker image. So here is essentially the outline for this application. 
And Visual Studio not only adds the Docker file, but it adds Docker Compose so I can deploy it later. And here, Visual Studio knows that, hey, this is now Dockerized. I can just hit debug. Visual Studio leaps into action and packages up this image and then runs it inside of Docker running on my machine. So here it is. Now I'm spinning up my ASP.NET Core web application, and then it will launch the browser into a real live debug session. So here's my swagger definition. Here's all the items that the app was reading out. Say, try it out. And I'm inside of Visual Studio debugging a Docker image from Visual Studio and Docker, just like I always have. Awesome. Now, when I'm ready to deploy, though, I want to make sure I can take it absolutely everywhere and anywhere. That's why I put it in a Docker image. So, of course, I'm just going to let Visual Studio handle all of the hard work when I want to publish. What do I always do? Right-click, publish. Of course I do. That's how I get it up into Azure. So what's nice here is that since I've added the Docker file and Docker Compose support, it knows that I can then take that and deploy that Docker image into Azure Container Registry. Or better yet, since it's a web API, it can do that and then also deploy it immediately out into an Azure app service. So I hit publish. Now Visual Studio knows that this is a Docker image that it needs to deploy to the Container Registry, and it handles all of the heavy lifting for you with a single button click. Awesome. And I've just showed you not only how to build, uh, yeah, you can clap, it's awesome. Yeah. I've showed you how to get started with mobile development with nothing more than your iOS and Android device with Visual Studio, and how to build beautiful web backends with ASP.NET Core and to publish it up into Docker images, all from Visual Studio. Thank you so much, and have a great Ignite. So UPS is one of the largest shipping and logistics companies in the world. And they're now using a combination of .NET Core, Xamarin, and Azure to build rich new customer and employee experiences. Here's a video of them talking about the success they've had. You know, but setting up a DevOps pipeline, you know, one that spans your build, test, and deployment environments, that has integrated analytics throughout it, and which is optimized for a team environment, you know, has traditionally not been easy. And it's required you to manually integrate a lot of different tools and systems together to get a solution. With Visual Studio Team Services, we're making it much easier to adopt a DevOps-based model and set your team up for success. VSTS is fully integrated into Azure and includes everything you need and works with every language and runtime environment you already have. And what I'd like to do now is invite Donovan Brown on stage to show off DevOps in Azure using VSTS. Here's Donovan. Thank you so much, Scott, and good morning, everyone. <laughs> Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Perfect. Today, we are all honorary members of the Visual Studio Team Services team. And with that honor comes the responsibility to ship every three weeks. To ship at that velocity and keep up our quality, we have to employ DevOps best practices. So it's Monday morning. We're walking into our team room, and on our Surface Hub is this dashboard. This dashboard is the game plan for our sprint. Shows me everything assigned to me, what pull requests I need to review, what bugs I need to resolve, and even shows me how many days are left on our sprint so that we can focus and deliver on our goals. Is anyone old enough to remember when your bugs were in one system, your user stories were in a different system, and your tasks were in yet a different system? What, am I the oldest person in here? Come on, those days luckily are gone. Now I have a product backlog that shows me my user stories, my bugs, and my tasks, all in one place and in priority order so that we can focus on the most important things first. Now, if you're anything like me, you hate writing status reports. Now I get it, I know why they're important, but I always feel that that time is better spent adding value to my product. So I love our new Kanban board. This, this is a real-time status report. At a glance, I can see what all my team members are doing. I can tell if there's an item that needs my attention. And to update my status, I simply drag and drop from one column to the next. Now, on our team, we use Git. And if you know anything about Git, that means branches, and lots of them. 
I used to create so many branches, I would forget why I created the branch. But luckily, if I use the Kanban board to come and create my branch, what's going to happen here is that this branch is now going to be associated with that work item. It doesn't end there. Every commit that I make to that branch will also be associated to that work item. But wait, if you order now, I'll add your builds and your releases as well. Everything automatically gets tied together for you. I can open up that work item, show you every line of code that was changed, every build that was triggered, and what environment is currently running in, all from creating a branch. Now, thank you, you can clap for that. That's awesomeness. Now eventually, all these branches have to come back together. We do that through something called a pull request. Now I've been writing software for over 20 years. I write software because it's fun. And I want a pull request to also be fun. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring a social aspect to pull request. I can open up a pull request that's assigned to me. And I can now communicate with my peers as if I were on any other social network. If the best way to communicate is through a meme or an emoji, I can do that. And if some code just gives me that warm and fuzzy feeling, I can actually share that with my team right here in my pull request. Ooh, that feels so good, right? We've all seen that line of code that just gets us excited and now I can share it in my PR. Now that the code has been pulled back into master, it's time for us to deploy that code into production. Now it's hard to do a show of hands when you have 26,000 people, but is there anyone out there that still manually deploys your software? Yeah, no one? Yeah, give me a break. But gone are the days where we throw our code over the fence like a hot potato. Now we pass it from team to team like a baton. This is where we break down the walls between dev and ops. What we're gonna do is we're gonna bring the power of Visual Studio Team Services right into the hands of the IT pro in the Azure portal. Now we're letting the IT pro uh, rub a little DevOps on it and make it better. We're gonna basically give you self-service DevOps. I simply click on the tile that represents my web app and now I'm presented a blade that allows me to set up continuous delivery. I get to use the power of VSTS, but I get to use it from Azure. As an IT pro, I no longer have to wait on my dev team to set up CI and set up CD. I can do it now myself. I can be the change agent. I can be the one forcing the DevOps best practices upon my organization. Step one, choose where I want my code. I can use Visual Studio Team Services, or I can even use GitHub if I'm working on open source. You do not have to move your code to take advantage of VSTS and Azure. I'm gonna use VSTS. I'll choose the account because it knows who I am. It's gonna load my project, and it's even gonna load the repository and the appropriate branch for me to make sure that I can actually go ahead and configure this. So there's my branch being loaded, and now I'm simply gonna click on OK. Once this OK is enabled, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna choose what language I wanna program in. Because you gotta remember this, <laughs> this is not your daddy's Microsoft. This is a Microsoft that understands Node.js, Python, and PHP. We can run this on Linux and we can run this on Windows. It's about time we tell the world, if you write software, here at Microsoft, we add value for any language targeting any platform. Now all I have to do now is click on OK. This would be a great time to take a picture and send a tweet, but only send one because this will be done in a minute. What we're doing in the back end is Visual Studio Team Services and Azure are working together to build an entire CI CD pipeline. That's gonna allow the code to flow from the fingertips of my developers into the hands of my users. As the IT pro, you have always been the protector of our infrastructure, but now you can be the guardian of our pipeline to make sure that code continuously flows from our fingertips to our end users. This is being built for you, but you are in complete control. Now that it's done, I can take you into the build that was created for you. This build definition that was created for you is under your control. You can add to it whatever you need to to be successful. As you can see, it's already running. In resources that we're waiting for you in Azure, we have Linux build machines and Windows build machines just waiting to build your code for you. While that build is running, I wanna quickly show you the anatomy. It's just a series of tasks all of tasks that are open source, that you can go see exactly how we created them. You can create your own, you can add additional ones, or better yet, you can actually go to our marketplace. Here, we have new extensions added every day that add value to your CI and CD pipelines. We have to remember that DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. With Azure and Visual Studio Team Services, we can now do that for any language targeting any platform. 
Thank you so much, everyone. So we've looked at how productive you can be when you're building solutions using Azure. And you know, one of the great things about Azure, of course, is the fact that it gives you this productive experience everywhere. You know, one of the biggest differentiators with Azure versus other cloud providers is our hybrid cloud capabilities. You know, Microsoft's the only technology company delivering a complete hybrid cloud. And this is important because hybrid cloud isn't just a trend or a buzzword, it's the reality that every organization has. Hybrid does not mean just connectivity between your on-premises data centers and a public cloud. You know, real hybrid means integration and consistency across your entire technology estate. You know, from your identity system, to infrastructure and developer platform, to your data estate, through to your management and security operations. And one of the great capabilities that we're really excited about that's shipping today is Azure Stack, which is a key part of this story. Azure Stack is an extension of Azure. Azure Stack provides a consistent cloud experience with the same management API, same set of developer services, same management portal that's available in Azure. And it's one that you can deploy and run literally anywhere. You know, for example, with Azure Stack, you can now use the cloud for edge and disconnected scenarios, like on a ship out at sea where the network might not be reliable, or a factory floor where you might need incredibly low latency to your embedded automation systems for production. You know, the combination of Azure and Azure Stack also now allow you to meet literally every regulatory need. You know, Azure today has more compliance certifications than any other cloud provider, and also runs in more countries and regions than any other cloud provider as well. And yet we know there's still gonna be scenarios where the data and applications need to reside in a specific country that doesn't yet have a public cloud provider with a data center. And this is where Azure Stack now allows you to complete that story. You know, let me show you an example of one company that's leveraging this. You know, ENY is one of the largest professional services firms in the world, and they're using Azure to run many of their applications. And being a trusted and secure cloud provider was the key reason why they chose Azure. You know, the documents and data that they store on it are amongst the most sensitive pieces of data in the world. And the challenge they've had is being able to use a single cloud application for all their clients. You know, some countries in the world, for example, Russia, require that company documents can't leave their soil, and no public cloud provider currently operates in that country. And the beauty of Azure Stack is that it gives EY now the ability to write their application once and deploy it both in Azure and run it in their own facilities in those countries with Azure Stack. And this gives them the ability to meet literally every regulatory requirement in every country in the world with a single code base. Let's watch a video of them telling their story. And Azure Stack also enables you to begin modernizing your on-premises applications even before you move them to public cloud. And the great thing is it's super easy to use and it's 100% consistent with full Azure. And so what I'd like to do is invite Natalia on stage to show off Azure Stack in action. Here's Natalia. Thanks, Scott. I am really excited to be here, but even more excited that we are shipping Azure Stack integrated systems. So let's take a look at the edge and disconnected scenario that Scott talked about and how Azure and Azure Stack working together can address that edge and disconnected scenario. So here I have a shipping company, Northwind Traders, that has a global fleet-wide application. They also have local processing that needs to be done on each ship, and they're using Azure Stack for each ship. In the global application, you can see each ship and their locations in the waters. If I go to the Azure portal, you can see all the application characteristics here that build the global fleet-wide application. We have event hubs. Event hubs is being used to receive and process massive data streams from each ship. We also have web apps that's being used for that live viewer monitoring on the ships. Now let's switch over to the systems running on the ships. We're gonna to switch to Azure Stack. Now if you look at the portal here, this is Microsoft Azure Stack. The portal looks identical. That's the entire point. There is API consistency. So the portal will be exactly the same in Azure as it is in Azure Stack. You can leverage people skills, processes, 
and applications across both Azure and Azure Stack. You can also have IaaS and PaaS services. Just like we had web apps running in Azure, we have web apps running in Azure Stack. Here we have functions. Remember, this is a disconnected scenario. You're in the middle of the ocean on a ship. And on that ship, bandwidth is super expensive. So it's a perfect use case for functions to parse the data. You can decide what flows to Azure to the global system. We can monitor all the events and have consistency from Azure and Azure Stack. It's the same serverless computing. Now let's take a look at how this hybrid application was developed. I'm going to switch over to Visual Studio. And here we can see the application components for that global application running in Azure. You can also see the application components running in Azure Stack. Here we can see functions that we talked about earlier, that serverless computing being used to parse data. We can make changes to an application. Now, I know Donovan said we have Visual Studio Team services, but here I'm going to do a manual deployment. I could use CI CD pipeline to actually deploy the application, but I'm going to manually kick off a deployment of the application to Azure Stack. Because I'm using Azure Active Directory, I can choose either Microsoft's Azure subscriptions or Azure Stack. So here I'm deploying to the local Azure Stack implementation on this ship. If I kick off the deployment, then I can see here is that application running on Azure Stack. That's the power of Azure and Azure Stack. Azure Stack truly is an extension of Azure. It gives you the capability to use the same processes to build, to deploy, and to operate your applications wherever your business needs. Thank you. Back to Scott. I'm incredibly excited to announce that as of today, we're now shipping Azure Stack systems. Yeah. We now have certified Azure Stack appliances made by HP, Dell, Lenovo, and Cisco. Uh, they're on display at the expo floor here at Ignite, and they're now all available for order. And we're really excited to see the great hybrid cloud solutions that you're going to stand up on top of them. So with you know, Azure Stack, you now have the ability to stand up a local Azure cloud anywhere in a matter of hours. You know, no other cloud gives you this type of hybrid consistency and flexibility. Now, one of the most complex as well as the highest value aspects of any application is how it actually uses data. And dealing with data in a hybrid application or a full cloud migration situation has historically been very challenging. And one of the great things about Azure is how it enables you to use SQL Server consistently across your entire hybrid cloud estate. Earlier this year, uh, we introduced our new SQL Server 2017 release. SQL Server 2017 is the fastest, most secure, and most intelligent database on the planet, and now provides ultimate flexibility. We're releasing SQL Server 2017 simultaneously on Windows Server, Linux, as well as Docker-based systems. In fact, we've had more than two million pull requests of our SQL Server Linux image from Docker Hub over the last three months alone. It's one of them. <laughs> SQL Server 2017 also delivers unparalleled performance with our new adaptive query processing engine, making it the fastest release of SQL Server ever. And we now enable you to use machine learning models built with R and Python and run them in memory directly inside the database, making your apps more intelligent uh, than ever before as well. And really the combination of this flexibility, performance, and built-in AI is winning new fans to SQL Server, including from startups and enterprises that frankly never considered using SQL Server before. Let's hear from DB01, a financial services startup, about their experience and why they decided to switch to SQL Server 2017 on Linux. Here's their story. Let's take a look at how developers, including those not using Windows, can install and start using SQL Server 2017 running in a Docker container today. Here's Lara to show it off. Thanks, Scott. Hello, Ignite. 
How exciting. Uh, it's fantastic to be here and show off SQL Server 2017. We've got a great release, and uh, I'm, I'm super thrilled to just be able to show off what we've got going on. As Scott mentioned, we, uh, we can run this and deploy this anywhere. That includes Windows and Linux. And that's great news, because I'm running on a Mac right now, and I don't have SQL installed yet. So the first thing we do before we start uh, getting into some of the advanced features, I need to install SQL Server. So to get started, I'm going to pull the latest SQL image from the repo. And once we have that image uh, downloaded, let's light up our image. As I light up my image, I'm going to give it my SA password. I'm going to give it uh, the port numbers, and that's it. So from here, we're going to do our installation of SQL Server. So if you bear with me for an hour or two while I install SQL Server, and we're done. How about that? <laughs> so, so it appears like we've got SQL installed. Let's just make sure that SQL is running. And to do that, I'm going to connect to SQL Server using our tools, the SQL, SQL Server tools installed right here on my Mac. And we'll just uh, run a quick statement. And everything is running, so we're all set to go. All right, less impressive. <laughs> OK, now that we know that we've got SQL Server running, I'd also like to test and make sure I can connect to this with external applications. SQL supports all the major programming languages, PHP, Python, Ruby, all the major languages. And in fact, I've got an application, a very simple application already set up here. And this is a Node.js application that's using the open source TDS drivers. And all it's going to do is just issue a connected once it's able to reach SQL Server. So we'll come out back to our terminal, and let's, let's issue our application, and we're connected. So how about this? In just about a minute, I downloaded, I installed, and I connected to SQL Server. It's pretty impressive, isn't it? All right. Now, this is not just a database engine. This is an enterprise-grade database platform with all the advanced features for, for maximum security, for robust performance, for manageability, everything you expect out of this engine. To give you an example of how you can use this for your advanced workloads, let's have a look at how we can improve application performance with SQL Server 2017. For this, I need data. I also need an app. So we're just going to start with data. And I'm going to issue this command. And this command will create an orders table. Come back out here. This orders table will have a couple of different interesting columns, and it's going to end up with 5 million rows of data, just enough data to be interesting. For an app, I have an ASP.NET Core application, and it's connecting to my local instance. As you can see, it's just going to start by issuing a select sum over the price column of that orders table. So let's go ahead and run our app. Now we got everything running. We'll connect. Now what I'm doing is issuing just a baseline. We want to find out how the performance is with our SQL Server before we make any changes. So we're starting at 231 milliseconds. I know I can improve performance with SQL Server 2017. So let's go back and make one minor adjustment. And what I'd like to do is create a clustered column store index. So we'll connect back out to SQL Server. A clustered column store index is unique to SQL Server. Nobody else has this. It stores the data in a special order on disk. This maximizes the compression, and it makes performance just super, super fast. And that's great for things like uh, aggregate queries, like we have on our, on our uh, query earlier, our sum. So if we come back, and let's rerun our application and see how our performance improves. We're down to six milliseconds. That's from a single. That's from a single line of T-SQL. One line. 
Now, what's really fantastic is that in the past, features like cluster column store index, as well as in-memory tables, or role-level security, or compression, as well as many others, were only available in the enterprise edition of SQL Server. Well, today, they're available in every edition of SQL Server, including SQL Server Express. So go download SQL Server 2017 today, start building some apps, and have fun with your new database engine. Thank you. So I'm incredibly excited to announce the general availability of SQL Server 2017 on Windows, Linux, and in Docker containers. You can download the release and start using it today. Now, one of the things that makes SQL Server unique is that it's really the only data platform out there today that's available both on premises and as a fully managed database service in the cloud using Azure. And what this means is you can now take advantage of all of that SQL Server functionality, uh, including column or store, in memory, all the great stuff that Laura talked about anywhere, and get the best possible experience now when using it as a fully managed service in Azure. You can stand up a SQL database in Azure in under 60 seconds and have it be highly available, durable, secure, and fault tolerant without you having to configure anything. Azure provides built-in backup and point-in-time restore capabilities, automatic performance tuning support, and threat detection security capabilities that enable you to securely run your systems. And best of all, you get all these capabilities without having to manage virtual machines or worry about patching or tuning your infrastructure manually. Our SQL database as a service offering takes care of all that for you. We now have a new Azure data migration service that will make it even easier to migrate your existing databases to use our SQL uh, database as a service in Azure. The data migration service streamlines moving existing database systems to Azure and provides a fully automated workflow to do so, both for on-premise SQL, uh, SQL Server databases as well as for other non-Microsoft database platforms, including Oracle database systems as well. And the new data migration service combined with the capabilities that we're adding to our SQL uh, database offering this year is gonna make it trivially easy to migrate any existing SQL Server database to the cloud without having to change any code in the application and have a seamless near zero downtime migration experience. Now DocuSign is an example of one Azure customer taking advantage of this new capability. You know, DocuSign is one of the leading enterprise SaaS providers today supporting 200 million different users. And they've historically run their own transaction processing database systems within their own data centers. And we're honored that they've chosen Azure as their preferred cloud platform to run their systems going forward. Here's a video of them talking about this decision. I invite Lara back on stage to walk through what it looks like to migrate a complex SQL Server-based application that exists today to Azure with zero downtime and no code changes required. Here's Lara. Thanks again, Scott. It's great to be back. <laughs> So many of you are uh, work, or many of you have applications that are powered by SQL Server, and many of you are migrating and modernizing with the cloud. Now there are a class of applications that have complex database requirements. They require things like SQL Agent, CLR, um, the cross database joins, or VNet. And in the past, these dependency pr dependencies prevented you from taking advantage of the modern PaaS database experience. Well, the great news is that all of these and more are now supported with the new Azure SQL DB managed instance. Let me show you how this works. I have Stack Overflow's enterprise application deployed locally. And it, if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see that we are connected, well, we're connected to SQL Server 2008 R2, hosted in my data center. This application is dependent on two databases and requires cross database joins to render these views. Let's migrate these databases to Azure. To migrate to our new Azure SQL DB managed instance, I'm going to use the database migration service. The service is very intuitive, super easy to use. I start, start by giving it the name of my target. Whoops, I, sorry, I guess I already clicked and we're running it. So we give it the name of the target. 
And then we add in the name of the source, SQL Server 2008 R2 environment. This can be either uh, any supported version of SQL Server, or it could also be um, Oracle or MySQL. With a couple of additional settings, we just set Run Migration. And as you can see, we're already running our migration. If we click into the progress, you can see that our databases are already restoring, and in fact, one of them has completed. Now, this supports multiple scale types, everything from small megabyte-sized databases up to multi-terabyte-sized databases, all with minimal downtime. Now, let's just quick, click a quick refresh. If we come back to our service and we refresh up here, you can see that we've already succeeded. So we're migrated and we're now running in the cloud. Now, I'm gonna come back to my application. And in my application, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna change our connection string. And now I'm going to point it to that managed Azure SQL DB managed instance that I created earlier this morning and that we migrated our application databases to. Now, if I run my application locally again, it's going to connect up to our managed instance, and there you are. We have our cross database joins rendering correctly without any changes to my application. If we scroll down to the bottom, you can see that we are connected to Azure SQL DB managed instance. Thank you. Now, this is not a virtual machine. This is a managed PaaS database service. I don't have to worry about upgrade, updating my operating system. I don't have to worry about upgrading SQL Server. I don't have to worry about managing machine configurations. Azure takes care of all of this and more for me. And I get the, I get the advantages of running SQL in Azure. Azure is the best cloud for SQL Server. It will help me maintain the highest availability, the strongest security, and the maximum performance for my application databases. And that's it. I'm going to appreciate your time. Thank you. You saw how easy it was for Lara to migrate a large real-world application, in this case here, stackoverflow.com from a SQL Server running on-premises to run using our SQL database as a service offering inside Azure, literally with no code changes. And the ability to easily migrate workloads also leads to incredible cost savings with Azure versus other cloud providers. Uh, this is, uh, data on this slide here is from one large enterprise customer who evaluated a cloud migration to both AWS and Azure for literally hundreds of their different Windows Server and SQL Server application workloads. And the ability to easily migrate their apps without having to make code changes, combined with the ability for them to easily use the existing Windows Server and SQL Server licenses that they'd already purchased, enabled the migration to Azure to literally be 70% more cost effective, in this case here, enabling them to save millions of dollars on top of that migration. Now, data is fundamental to developing breakthrough intelligent apps. And Azure provides a complete set of data and AI services that enable you to build these types of transformational solutions and to do them at planet scale and to enable your businesses to reach literally every customer in the world. Earlier this year, we released Azure Cosmos DB, which is the first globally distributed multi-model database service that delivers horizontal scale-out with guaranteed single-digit millisecond latency. You know, it's designed to explicitly handle these types of next-generation intelligent apps. You know, imagine a horizontally scalable database uh, that puts data everywhere that your users are. You know, with Cosmos DB, we've built a database service that does just that and can automatically replicate your data to any Azure region around the world to give your users lightning fast performance regardless of where they're accessing your application. Cosmos DB also enables you to elastically scale your storage and performance throughput across one or multiple Azure regions with zero application downtime. You could start with, say, just gigabytes of data and then scale to manage petabytes of it. You can start with processing just, say, 100 operations per second, but then scale up to, to handle tens of millions of operations per second. And best of all, with Cosmos DB, you pay just for the storage and performance you need, enabling you to save a tremendous amount of money. 
Cosmos DB, starting today, also now allows you to run serverless code in response to data changes inside your Cosmos DB database. Using our Azure Function Service, which enables you to dynamically run code without having to have a dedicated VM provisioned, you can now run code at a global scale and pay only for the compute cycles you need, all integrated with the data that you store inside Cosmos DB. This provides a fantastic way that you can infuse intelligent logic even deeper with your data. And Cosmos DB is also the only database with comprehensive SLAs across availability, data consistency, and performance. In fact, Cosmos DB, as I mentioned, guarantees single-digit millisecond response time at the 99th percentile as one of the SLAs. And you can directly monitor this and all the other SLAs directly inside the Azure Management Portal. ASOS is a great customer of ours running in Azure today, and it's really a fantastic example of the type of applications that can really take advantage of a database service like Cosmos DB. Here's a video of them talking about ASOS.com and how they're leveraging Azure. ASOS wants to be start using on any computer today to start building rich AI applications. Today, we're also excited to announce a new VM family inside Azure that uses the latest P40 and P100 NVIDIA GPUs. This family of GPUs is optimized for deep learning AI scenarios and enables you to build even richer AI applications. And Azure is the only public cloud provider today that supports both the P40 and P100s, giving you even more flexibility as you look to build intelligent apps. So the Microsoft Cloud is optimized for organizations. You know, for us, enterprises are not an afterthought. They're a critical design point. And it's not just about technology. You know, Microsoft has decades of experience supporting businesses and enterprise customers of every size. And this means we really understand the critical requirements of running software for businesses, including certifications, data sovereignty, security, and privacy. You know, in fact, Azure now has more compliance certifications than any other cloud provider out there. With Azure, we also give you the tools and integrated monitoring support to ensure that the workloads you put on Azure follow security best practices and apply the comprehensive security intelligence that Microsoft has to your applications. And we're releasing a bunch of great new capabilities to our Azure Security Center this week uh, that's integrated directly into the Azure Management Console, uh, including new hybrid threat detection capabilities as well as security incident remediation support. And what we'd like to do is invite Sarah on stage to demo some of these new capabilities off and show you how they enable you to build even more secure applications in the cloud. Here's Sarah. Thanks, Scott. With built-in intelligence and analytics, Azure Security Center can help every Azure customer be more secure. Today, I'm going to show you how Azure Security Center can help you ensure that security best practices are applied, help you to lock down remote access, and enable you to act quickly should an attack occur. Let's get started. So here in Azure Security Center, which you can access from the left pane in the Azure portal, you get a unified view of security across all your Azure workloads, and it's always up to date. Let's take a look at compute. Here we see a list of recommendations for best practices for securing your Azure VMs. This includes things like making sure that your systems are up to date, that encryption is enabled, and that your Windows and Linux configurations are hardened. We can click in to get additional details. Here we see a list of potentially vulnerable configurations, and you can click in to take action to remediate these. Now, one important best practice is to limit remote access to your virtual machines. But this can be a bit problematic because many of you require the ability to remotely log in for management purposes. Security Center's new just-in-time VM access capability helps. It discovers VMs that aren't protected, and you can simply specify rules for how you want your users to connect, and Security Center takes care of the rest. When a user needs access to that virtual machine, they can request it here in Security Center or using PowerShell. They'll simply specify how they want to connect to that virtual machine and for how long. And uh, as long as that request complies with the rules that were set earlier, access will be automatically granted to that VM. So the user can get in and do their work. So unfortunately, attackers will continue to innovate, and you need tools that enable you to respond quickly when that happens. Azure Security Center alerts you to threats that it detects using advanced analytics, like machine learning, and tapping into Microsoft's vast global threat intelligence. 
Related alerts are combined into security incidents like the one that we're seeing here. Now every second counts when you're under attack. And we're very excited to unveil a new investigation experience that greatly reduces the amount of time and the level of expertise required to investigate. Here we see a security alert. In this case, a user didn't follow best practices and that enabled an attacker to gain access to a VM via a brute force attack against one of their management ports. So we can click on that compromised server to, to learn more. Built-in queries make it easy to access related security events, and you can also conduct your own ad hoc queries over security data as well. Now here we see that a user, Abby Becker, has added herself as an administrator to this particular machine. That's a bit suspect. So if we go back to the graph, we can learn more about what this account has been up to. We see that there's a sign in from an unfamiliar location. It looks like this account has been compromised. So you need to understand what else has this not Abby been up to? We can see that the account was used to sign into another server in the environment and on that machine to execute a suspicious process, likely some form of malware. New integration with playbooks makes it easy to automate response. So you could take action to block Abby's user account or to quarantine this VM to prevent further damage. Now, Azure is the only major cloud provider to offer all of these built-in security capabilities. And we're so excited today to announce the ability to now extend these capabilities beyond Azure to help protect workloads running on premises and in other clouds. This greatly simplifies the process of managing security and protecting against threats across all of your hybrid cloud workloads. You can simply open Security Center and the Azure portal to get started today. Thank you. So another important aspect of trust in the cloud is understanding how much the cloud costs. You know, no one wants a surprise bill, and as you run more and more workloads in the cloud, it becomes even more important that you can accurately budget and forecast how much your cloud is gonna cost. Earlier this summer, Microsoft acquired Cloudin, a leader in cloud-based cost management. And today I'm excited to announce that Cloudin is now integrated into Azure and that we're making available the Cloudin functionality to all Azure customers for free. This means that you can now easily optimize your Azure spend and get greater visibility and accountability of your Azure usage and even implement policies like internal chargebacks and budgets in a really easy way. Today, we're also announcing a new reserved VM instance model that enables you to guarantee VM capacity ahead of use, as well as achieve cost savings of up to 72% when running VM workloads inside Azure. And as part of this, we're also introducing with this the flexibility to exchange or adjust reserved instance purchases, enabling you to save even more money uh, using the cloud. And to show off some of these new cost management capabilities in Azure, uh, as well as how you can model savings using reserved instances, I'd like to invite Julia White on stage. Here's Julia. Thanks, Scott. All right. Now, a key value of the cloud is paying for only what you use. It offers great cost savings over on-premises approaches. However, we definitely heard from all of you that you need more insight and visibility into your costs to make sure that you can feel in control of all of your cloud spend. And that's exactly what we now have with Azure Cost Management powered by Cloudin. And what it does, it gives you, you real-time visibility into every aspect of your cloud spend. And you can also create departmental level budget and allocations. So let's take a look. So here I am in the dashboard, and you can see over there, you know, there's a new cost management blade option. Now, this will go live in the portal later this afternoon. And when I get there, I can just deep link with single sign-on right into my Azure cost management powered by Cloudin dashboard. So here in my kind of overview dashboard, I see all the different views of spend. I can break down in a number of different ways. Now, one of the areas of the largest spend is around VMs. So I'm going to go ahead and drill down into my VM spend specifically. And you can see I'm getting a really nice view of all of my spend across what's going on. But then I have this big spike right here. Now, this might be a great thing because my marketing campaign's on fire and everyone's hitting my site, or it might be something that I need to drill into and understand. I can just do that very simply right here in the cost management tools. 
but I can also get budget man uh, cost management in a bunch of other really helpful ways and get that visibility. Things like, where are my application costs? What are my departmental level costs? And what are my spending on R&D versus production, as an example? So here you see I have all that broken down. I can just hover over. I can see what my production system looks like. I can see different applications within that. And then, more importantly, I can take that and download it directly into an Excel, and I pull it up. And with this, I can create cost allocations for different departments in my organization and hold them accountable and also give them the visibility to do that at a departmental level. But if I go back to my uh, cost management, one of the other capabilities is around budget management. So here I put in what my budget is and then what my current expected run rate for what I'm actually using is going to look like. And you can see here I'm, I'm on path to exceed my budget. So I need to work on some optimization. Now, there's two key ways to do optimization uh, with the cost management tools. The first one is to look at my CPU utilization. So here I'm getting a drill down of exactly what my utilization looks like across my environment. And here I have a number of resources that are very highly utilized, and I might actually consider upgrading those to larger instances. But I equally have things that are just 0 to 25% utilized. And these are opportunities for me to downgrade to smaller sizes that are less expensive and get that budget back into line. Now, the other way to do optimization is what Scott just announced, which is our reserved instances that are coming to Azure. Now, once they're in Azure, you get this view here in the cost management tools that show me what it would look like if I did a standard pay-as-you-go approach or if I purchased with reserved instances. And I can see where that break-even is based on the project that I have. And in this specific example, it would show me that using reserved instances would save me about 33% over time. So I quickly get that cost-benefit trade-off on how to best manage my spend. So overall, really excited about how Azure cost management gives you full visibility and control over all of your cloud spend. As Scott said, no one wants a surprise bill. And this gives you comprehensive budget management across that. So thank you so much. Back to Scott. And all that great capability that Julia just mentioned is now available free for every Azure customer and you're gonna be able to start taking advantage of it later this afternoon once it goes live. So the opportunity to build applications that can change the world has never been greater. And each of you now has access to cloud resources that were unimaginable just a few years ago. Uh, and there really has never been a better time to be in technology. And all of us on the Azure team are really looking forward to helping enable your success, and we can't wait to see the amazing solutions that we know you're going to build. Thanks so much, and have a great rest of Ignite. We are living in an age of...